I am honored today to have my son-in-law preach for me and to give me a break and let me sit down and just hear the Word of God. So, Lionel, uh, this is my son-in-law. Amen. Come share the Word of God with us. Let me get this stuff out of your way. Amen. God is good. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Worshiping with you good people. Amen. I'm privileged and honored to be here and to be able to speak to you today is a privilege for me. And I just thank God for every opportunity that he gave me to share his word. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, God, that name that's above all name. God, there's none like you. Hallelujah. And God, I pray for your congregation today, your people here, oh God, that come together in your name, oh God. God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch us, oh God, and help us, oh God. Send us help from your throne room today, oh God. Oh, how we need you, oh God. And I pray, oh God, that you would help me, oh God, to preach your word, oh God. I thank you, oh God, today. And I bless you today in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I want to start off this sermon today by asking you a question. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> Amen. And I'm not talking about Brother Matt. I know they're all looking at you right now. <laughs> but is there a doctor in the house? And I'm going to be reading out of the book of Jeremiah, starting out in chapter 8, verses 4 to 22 in the New Living Translation. It says, Jeremiah said to the people, this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, don't they get up again? When they start down the wrong road and discover their mistakes, don't they turn back? Then why do these people keep going along their self-destructive paths, refusing to turn back, even though I have warned them? I listen to their conversations and what do I hear? Is any sorry for sin? Does anyone say what a terrible thing I have done? No, all are running down the path of sin as, as swiftly as a horse running to the battle. The stark knows the time of her migration as do the turtle dove, the swallow and the crane. They all return at the proper time each year, but not my people. They do not know what the law requires of them. How can you say we are wise because we have the law of the Lord when your teachers have twisted it so badly? These wise teachers will be ashamed by exile for their sin, for they have rejected the word of the Lord. Are they so wise after all? I would give their wives and their farms to others from the least to the greatest. They trick others to get what does not belong to them. Yes, even my prophets and my priests are like that. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. They give assurance of peace when all is war. Or they shame when they do these things, these disgusting things. No, not at all. They don't even blush. Therefore, we'll, we'll lie among the slaughter. They will be humbled when they are punished, says the Lord. I will take away their rich harvest of figs and grapes. Their fruit trees will all die. All the good things I prepared for them will soon be gone. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Then the people say, why should we wait here to die? Come, let us go to the fortified cities to die there. For the Lord our God has decreed our destruction and given us a cup of poison to drink because we've sinned against the Lord. We hoped for peace, but no peace came. We hoped at a time of healing, but found our terror. The snortings of the enemies, war horses can be heard all the way from the land of Dan in the north. The whole land trembles at the approach of the terrible army for it is coming to devour the land and everything in it, cities and people alike. And I will send these enemy troops among you, poisonous snakes you cannot charm, says the Lord. No matter what you do, they will bite. 
you and you will die. My grief is behind healing. My heart is broken. I listen to the weeping of my people. It can be heard all across the land. Has the Lord abandoned Jerusalem? The people ask. Is her king no longer there? Oh, why have they angered me with their carved idols and worthless gods? Ask the Lord. The harvest is finished and the summer is gone. And the people cry, yet we are not saved. I weep for the hurt of my people. I am stunned and silent and mute with grief. Is there no medicine in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why is there no healing for the wounds of my people? And I want to read three verses in the King James Version in uh, 20, verses 20 through 22. It says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, am I hurt? I am black. Astonishment had taken hold of me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? The prophet Jeremiah began to look. <clears throat> the prophet Jeremiah began to look at the bad condition that God's people were in, and began, he began to ask this question: Is there any bomb in Gilead? Is there a doctor in the house who can heal the wounds and hurt of my people? Gilead was a city in Israel beyond the Jordan River, known for its healing ointments. The ointment was an effective bomb that had both medical and cosmetic properties. The soothing ointment of Gilead brought both healing and beauty to a person. As a matter of fact, if you was a sick person and you were suffering with skin diseases and all of that type of stuff, Gilead was the place that you wanted to be. If you really needed a doctor, Gilead was that place where you needed to go to find a fine physician. The balm of Gilead came from a balsam tree. From the trunk and branches of these trees put a gum odor all over that land where it was growing. This particular, particular tree grew only in the soil in the climate, only in this soil and in this climate and gained a high reputation. Balm, of course, is a medicinal salve. The people were wounded for their sins and idolatries and needed to be restored. This brokenness is compared as a disease or a physical disorder of an animal body, animal body to illustrate how tragic sin really was. People had sought the bomb of Gilead to help their illness for centuries. In fact, the caravan that Joseph was sold to, sold to was headed to Egypt carrying a little carrying bomb from Gilead, and you can read that in Genesis 37, 25. A few years later, when Joseph sent his brothers back for their remaining brother, Benjamin, before he had revealed himself to them, their father Jacob said to take the best products of the land, carry down to the man as a present, a little balm. After, that, after the captivity, when Israel took the promised land, Gilead, on the west side of the Jordan, became part of the land, the tribe of Gad settled there. The, the bomb trade then became strong in Israel. The reason for all this was that one of the trees there put out a turpentine-like resin that was highly sought after. It is said that the bomb was worth twice its weight in silver. So Jeremiah's question is, how can a people who traded in bomb be so sick? How could they have so much medicine so many doctors and how could they be so sick when the medicine and the doctors was right there of course it's even worse than that this is a physical illustration of a spiritual point the real question behind the illustration is how can the people of God with the law in the midst of them be so sinful? They had all the answers. They had everything they need. It's kind of like how we see America today. It's just falling by the wayside. It ain't that we don't have no doctor in the house because the doctor is in the house every day. He has not left, and, but we just don't want to go to the doctor. Amen. 
Jesus summed it up in this statement. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, look what it says. It says this, people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There's a lot of people say they love God, but their heart is so far from him. They don't know who he is, but I tell you, the doctor is in the house, and he's here to do what you need him to do. Too many people are all talking, no action. They're just letting off lip service. People say they want to serve God, but they don't want to serve God. And when they serve God, they want to serve God under a prenuptial agreement. Uh, Hallelujah. Mm. A prenuptial agreement is an agreement written out between two people before they get married, just in case things don't work out. Now, things may not work out. It may not work out. So if it don't work out, I get to keep me, and you get to keep you. Hmm. Prenup. When people come to God and become part of the body of Christ, they want to come with their own prenuptial plan. This is what they say to God. God, I want to be blessed by you. I want you to bless me with this, this, and this. But in return, I don't want to give up everything. I just want to give up just a little bit of me. I just want to give up a part of me. But let me tell you, when you come to God, he said you got to come to me with your whole heart and your soul and your mind. You got to give up. You got to give up. This old song say give up and let Jesus Take over, give up, and let Jesus take over, give up, and let Jesus take over. See, that's what we got to do. We got to give up and stop fighting him, because when you fight him, you're going to lose. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm preaching good. You just don't know it yet. Hallelujah. In your mind, you get this false impression from the enemy that it's okay to sin a little bit. You begin, you begin to tell people, oh, it's not that bad. After a while, you begin believing this nonsense that, oh, it just ain't that bad. But even the Bible say a lie will send you straight to hell. Bible says all liars and thieves and robbers and whoremongers, it says you're going to that burning pit of fire if you get caught slipping and you die like that. You mean if I tell a lie I'm going? Yes, that's what the book says. You're going. I know this ain't popular preaching. But you know what? Popular preaching is pe sending people straight to hell. This guy's popular in this and that. He says it's okay. Oh, yeah? Well, the Bible don't say it's okay. You, he can say it's okay all he want. But we better look in this book. Amen. We better look in that book and see if it's okay or not. And if the Bible says it's not okay, it's not okay. I don't care what his name is on the church. Hallelujah. Let me tell you about a little bit of sin. A little bit of sin is like being a little bit of pregnant. <laughs> pregnant plus pregnant still is pregnant. You can't be a little bit of pregnant. If you're a little bit of pregnant, that baby going to grow after a while and eventually a baby going to pop out. Pregnant plus pregnant still equals pregnant, and sin plus sin still equals debt. You can count it up, count it up, and that's still what you're going to get. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. What is it? 
old things are what? Well, then why, how come we keep keeping the old things then? Why are we still doing the old things then? This ain't my book. I'm just the messenger. He wrote it. Now, in my flesh, I would like to write a few things different. God cannot slap people today. But just about every day, he says, no, you can't slap them today. <laughs> Old things have passed away and all things have become new. This let me know that our old way of thinking has got to go. There's a process that we need to undertake after we get saved. It's that old man's struggle. The old man's struggle that still wants to do the old things has got to die. He's got to die. The Bible calls this process sanctification. Nelson Bible Dictionary describes sanctification as the process of God's grace by which a believer is separated from sin and becomes dedicated to God's righteousness. The results of sanctification brings in holiness or purification from the guilt and power of sin. The word sanctify means to be set apart. Sanctification is the second work of grace after salvation, and we must come in contact with it in order for us to walk through the pearly gates. Because he says anybody doing these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we got to have an encounter with sanctification. You got to have your encounter with it. It ain't good enough to say, yeah, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and I'm just going to keep on doing what I want to do. You got to have a you got to have a confrontation with God. I don't care what your struggle is. It might be a big struggle, and you might have been trying to kick it for years. But I tell you one thing, sanctification can deal with that. You got to deal with it. You got to deal with you. Your biggest obstacle going to heaven right now is not the devil. It's you. It's you. You got to look you in the eye and say, we're going to fight today. We're going to fight today. We're going to get this. We're going to settle this once and for all. I am not going to be like this. Hallelujah. Sanctification means to completely uproot the sinful nature from a man's heart. Some people just want to get saved and paint over the old heart and leave it the way it is. But it's not God's will for us just to get saved and not to be completely changed. It does, it, he doesn't want us to paint over the old heart. He wants us to be sanctified. He wants the old heart to be completely uprooted. You need to get a shovel and dig that old heart out. I don't want narrow root. And the only way to kill the snake in you is to chop off the head. Quit hitting the tail. You're never going to kill a snake. He's still going to be slithering around. But you kill that head, he going to die. <laughs> he going to die. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4, I want you to read it. Please read. Go ahead, read. For this is what? This is the will of God. It's the will of God for what? For, for us to be sanctified, amen? amen? That everyone should know how to possess his vessel and sanctification and honor. A lot of people says, I can't do it. But look what Leviticus uh, 20, verse 7 through 8 says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord, and you shall keep my statutes and do them. And I am the Lord, which sanctify you. Romans 6, 12 says this, Let no sin, therefore, live in your reign or live in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust thereof. 
When God wrote this, you, do you think he put this in the book because he, because you wasn't capable of doing it? God doesn't not, he doesn't ask us to do something that we're not capable of doing. Too many people today want to keep the corner sanctification of the Old Testament. You know what the carnival, the carnal sanctification of the Old Testament is? It's called, I get the sin all year, and then at the end of the year, I'll bring a sacrifice to cover up my sins. And then when the next year starts, I get the sin all year, and then when I get to the end of the year, I get to bring a sacrifice to cover up my sins. And we still want the Old Testament sanctification. But you know what? We have the Old Testament, and now we have the New Testament, the Jesus-type sanctification, the right-now sanctification, the sanctification that I can do to you today, sanctification. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. They don't want spiritual sanctification that's been provided through the blood of Jesus Christ that enable us to instantaneously stop sinning. You mean I can stop sinning today? Yes. All for a little low price of getting on your knees and coming to the altar. And oh my God. Hallelujah. Don't get me started. I'm trying to stay serious. And something else we need to know sanctification is not just for the preacher, it's for the preacher and the people. Amen. Is there any bomb to work bomb to work in your life? Is there a doctor in the house who can help your wounds? Sure it is. Sure it is. I don't care what your wounds is today. I've had some serious wounds growing up. I'm from the ghetto of ghettos, and I've had some horrible, terrible, terrible things happen to me. And I took my wife to visit the ghetto one time to visit my family. And she said, how do you still have your right mind? <laughs> I mean, I took her to the hood, hood, hood. And she like she in Washington State with her purse on her lap. And we're rolling down the street. I said, you better put that purse on the floor and stick it under the seat. <laughs> she says, oh, OK, I didn't know. I said, yeah, you in a different place now. Look around. <laughs> Is there a doctor in the house? This is what the great physician wants to perform in your life. Second Peter uh, 3, 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but uh, that all should come to repentance. He wants us to repent. Psalms 103, 1 through 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, hallelujah, who forgiveth all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. He wants to give us benefits after he has forgiven our sins and heal our diseases. He don't give us the benefits before, he gives them to us after. Amen. Psalms 24, 7 to 10 says, lift up your heads, all you gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors. And what? The king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He wants to give you power in your life. Amen. Malachi 4, 1 through 2 says, For behold, the day coming that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, amen, shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wing, and ye shall go forth as and grow up as calves of the stall. He wants you to escape the horrible day of judgment to come. Amen. Amen. 
Isaiah 27 says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the burden shall be taken off of your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed and the yoke from off of your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. What yoke? It is the yoke of Satan that he has people tied up with. God says, I want to deliver you from that. I want to take that old nasty chain and them old ropes that the devil's been tying you up with. Hallelujah. And I want to deliver you. Luke 4, 18 through 19 says this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them that are burned, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. God wants to help you if you're poor. He wants to help you if you're brokenhearted. He wants to help you if you're in spiritual prison. He wants to help you if you're blinded by Satan. And, and he wants to help you if you have a lot of wounds in your life. Hallelujah. I don't care how old there is, how bad it is. God wants to help you with every wound. Hallelujah. Somebody say, when can I start this plan? <laughs> Hallelujah. Today, amen, this plan is available today. But I want you to know, <laughs> in limited time only, <laughs> the cell's going to soon run out. Mmm. Hallelujah. Psalm 68 says, bless the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. God wants to daily load you with benefits. Exodus 15, 26, and if, says, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and will do that which is right in his sight. And will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that heals you. Amen. How many know God wants to keep you healed? He wants to heal you and then he wants to keep you healed. He don't want it to come back. There's too much stuff keeps coming back. Hallelujah, this keep coming back. My drug addiction keeps coming back. I keep on cussing and all of this crazy stuff. I keep on fighting and all of that. Now God wants to deliver you and he don't want it to come back. Amen. I'm going to close with this. I believe it's time to invite the doctor back in your life. Amen. You may be too wounded to get off your sick bed, but I got it on good report. He makes house calls. Amen. Amen. God will meet you where you at. There is no sickness that is too great for him to heal. There is no sin that is too great for him to operate on. Amen. He's the master surgeon. Amen. Will you schedule your appointment? Today, he takes walk-ins. Amen. He's more like an emergency room, not like a clinic. He's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the God that's ready for you. He's ready for you. Hallelujah. Don't wait no longer. Come and get what you need to get from him today. He got the healing ointment, the healing balm, whatever you need, the healing medicine. God has it for you. We must ask ourselves this question today. Do we have the soil? And do we have the climate for the medicine to grow? Do we have the soil and do we have the climate for the doctor to work here today? For the doctor to work here today? Are you so sin sick that you don't even realize that anything is wrong? Are you so sick 
Or are you sick enough to admit that you need to see the doctor? I don't know. I done ran up on some people. I'm mean, like, oh, you, need, you really need to go to the doctor. You need to go to the doctor. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know. You need to, but I know one thing what you need to do. You need to go to the doctor. The doctor's here. Stand with me today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The doctor's here today. Hallelujah. I want you to take this message very seriously. You need to think about this situation as if, well, really, we come to church once a week, the doctor come in once a week, right? That's how they used to do back in the old days. The doctor would come and visit the town and boom, boom, boom. You better get, go see the doc while he's here because you'll have a whole nother week to be sick. But he's here. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We want to pray for those that may have a physical sickness or a spiritual sickness today. You might have some spiritual sickness that you need God to heal you from. You may have a physical sickness that God may need to heal you from. And I'm going to ask you, if you're in any of those categories and you want to be prayed for, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Don't be ashamed. Look, hey, I've been spiritually sick before. And that's the worst kind of sick. To me, it's worse than physical sick. It's to be spiritually sick. And I used to be very spiritually sick. But God helped me. I don't even know how he pulled that off, except he's God. It had to be God to pull off what he pulled off in me. Amen. I was toe up from the floor. up. But I'm going to ask you, if you in that category... Look, we all are just here to help each other. That's it. We're trying to get to heaven, right? So I'm going to ask you to just come forward if you need to. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Just come on up. Don't worry about what nobody think. We family here. Hallelujah. 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 Just come on up. If you need a physical healing, come up. If you need a spiritual healing, come up. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord.